The Burial of the Rats by Bram Stoker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. The Burial of the Rats by Bram Stoker. Leaving Paris by the Orleans Road, cross the Enceinte and turning to the right, you find yourself in a somewhat wild and not at all savory district. Right and left, before and behind, on every side rise great heaps of dust and waste accumulated by the process of time. Paris has its night as well as its day life, and the sojourner who enters his hotel in the Rue de Rivoli or the Rue Saint-Honoré late at night or leaves it early in the morning can guess, in coming near Montrouge, if he has not done so already, the purpose of those great wagons that look like boilers on wheels, which he finds halting everywhere as he passes. Every city has its peculiar institutions created out of its own needs, and one of the most notable institutions of Paris is its rag-picking population. In the early morning, and Parisian life commences at an early hour, may be seen in most streets standing on the pathway opposite every court and alley and between every few houses, as still in some American cities, even in parts of New York, large wooden boxes into which the domestics or tenement holders empty the accumulated dust of the past day. Round these boxes gather and pass on, when the work is done, to fresh fields of labor and pastures new, squalid, hungry-looking men and women, the implements of whose craft consist of a coarse bag or basket slung over the shoulder and a little rake with which they turn over and probe and examine in the minutest manner the dust bins. They pick up and deposit in their baskets, by aid of their rakes, whatever they may find, with the same facility as a Chinaman uses his chopsticks. Paris is a city of centralization, and centralization and classification are closely allied. In the early times, when centralization is becoming a fact, its forerunner is classification. All things which are similar or analogous become grouped together, and from the grouping of groups rises one whole or central point. We see radiating many long arms with innumerable tentaculi, and in the center rises a gigantic head with a comprehensive brain and keen eyes to look on every side, and ears sensitive to hear, and a voracious mouth to swallow. Other cities resemble all the birds and beasts and fishes whose appetites and digestions are normal. Paris alone is the analogal apotheosis of the octopus. Product of centralization carried to an ad absurdum, it fairly represents the devilfish, and in no respects is the resemblance more curious than in the similarity of the digestive apparatus. Those intelligent tourists, who, having surrendered their individuality into the hands of Messrs. Cook or Gazet, do Paris in three days, are often puzzled to know how it is that the dinner which in London would cost about six shillings can be had for three francs in a café in the Palais Royal. They need have no more wonder if they will but consider the classification which is a theoretic specialty of the Parisian life, and adopt all round the fact from which the chiffonier has his genesis. The Paris of 1850 was not like the Paris of today, and those who see the Paris of Napoleon and Baron Haussmann can hardly realize the existence of the state of things forty-five years ago. Amongst other things, however, which have not changed are those districts where the waste is gathered. Dust is dust all the world over, in every age, and the family likeness of dust heaps is perfect. The traveler, therefore, who visits the environs of Montrouge can go back in fancy without difficulty to the year 1850. In this year I was making a prolonged stay in Paris. I was very much in love with a young lady who, though she returned my passion, so far yielded to the wishes of her parents that she had promised not to see me or to correspond with me for a year. 
I, too, had been compelled to accede to these conditions under a vague hope of parental approval. During the term of probation I had promised to remain out of the country and not to write to my dear one until the expiration of the year. Naturally, the time went heavily with me. There was no one of my own family or circle who could tell me of Alice, and none of her own folk had, I am sorry to say, sufficient generosity to send me even an occasional word of comfort regarding her health and well-being. I spent six months wandering about Europe, but as I could find no satisfactory distraction in travel, I determined to come to Paris, where, at least, I could be within easy hail of London in case any good fortune should call me thither before the appointed time. That hope deferred maketh the heart sick was never better exemplified than in my case, for, in addition to the perpetual longing to see the face I loved, there was always with me a harrowing anxiety lest some accident should prevent me showing Alice in due time that I had, throughout the long period of probation, been faithful to her trust and my own love. Thus, every adventure which I undertook had a fierce pleasure of its own, for it was fraught with possible consequences greater than it would have ordinarily borne. Like all travelers, I exhausted the places of most interest in the first month of my stay, and was driven in the second month to look for amusement whithersoever I might. Having made sundry journeys to the better-known suburbs, I began to see that there was a terra incognita, in so far as the guidebook was concerned, in the social wilderness lying between these attractive points. Accordingly, I began to systematize my researches, and each day took up the thread of my exploration at the place where I had on the previous day dropped it. In process of time, my wanderings led me near Montrouge, and I saw that hereabouts lay the ultima thule of special exploration, a country as little known as that round the source of the White Nile. And so I determined to investigate philosophically the chiffonier, his habitat, his life, and his means of life. The job was an unsavory one, difficult of the accomplishment, and with little hope of adequate reward. However, despite reason, obstinacy prevailed, and I entered into my new investigation with a keener energy than I could have summoned to aid me in any investigation leading to any end, valuable or worthy. One day, late in a fine afternoon, toward the end of September, I entered the Holy of Holies of the City of Dust. The place was evidently the recognized abode of a number of chiffoniers, for some sort of arrangement was manifested in the formation of the dust heaps near the road. I passed amongst these heaps, which stood like orderly sentries, determined to penetrate further and trace dust to its ultimate location. As I passed along, I saw behind the dust heaps of a few forms that flitted to and fro, evidently watching with interest the advent of any stranger to such a place. The district was like a small Switzerland, and as I went forward, my tortuous course shut out the path behind me. Presently, I got into what seemed a small city or community of chiffoniers. There were a number of shanties or huts, such as may be met with in the remote parts of the Bog of Allen, rude places with wattled walls plastered with mud and roofs of rude thatch made from stable refuse, such places as one would not like to enter for any consideration, and which, even in watercolor, could only look picturesque if judiciously treated. In the midst of these huts was one of the strangest adaptations I cannot say habitations, I had ever seen. An immense old wardrobe, the colossal remnant of some boudoir of Charles the Seventh or Henry the Second, had been converted into a dwelling-house. The double doors lay open, so that the entire menage was open to public view. In the open half of the wardrobe was a common sitting-room of some four feet by six, in which sat, smoking their pipes round a charcoal brazier, no fewer than six old soldiers of the First Republic, with their uniforms torn and worn threadbare. Evidently, 
they were of the mauvais sujet class. Their blear eyes and limp jaws told plainly of a common love of absinthe, and their eyes had that haggard, worn look which stamps the drunkard at his worst, and that look of slumbering ferocity which follows hard in the wake of drink. The other side stood as of old, with its shelves intact, save that they were cut to half their depth, and in each shelf, of which there were six, was a bed made with rags and straw. The half-dozen of worthies who inhabited this structure looked at me curiously as I passed, and when I looked back, after going a little way, I saw their heads together in a whispered conference. I did not like the look of this at all, for the place was very lonely, and the men looked very, very villainous. However, I did not see any cause for fear, and went on my way, penetrating further and further into the Sahara. The way was tortuous to a degree, and from going round in a series of semicircles, as one goes in skating with the Dutch roll, I got rather confused with regard to the points of the compass. When I had penetrated a little way, I saw, as I turned the corner of a half-made heap, sitting on a heap of straw, an old soldier with a threadbare coat. Hello, I said to myself, the First Republic is well represented here in its soldiery. As I passed him, the old man never even looked up at me, but gazed on the ground with stolid persistency. Again I remarked to myself, See what a life of rude warfare can do. This old man's curiosity is a thing of the past. When I had gone a few steps, however, I looked back suddenly and saw that the curiosity was not dead, for the veteran had raised his head and was regarding me with a very queer expression. He seemed to me to look very like one of the six worthies in the press. When he saw me looking, he dropped his head, and without thinking further of him I went on my way, satisfied that there was a strange likeness between these old warriors. Presently I met another old soldier in a similar manner. He, too, did not notice me whilst I was passing. By this time it was getting late in the afternoon, and I began to think of retracing my steps. Accordingly I turned to go back, but could see a number of tracks leading between different mounds, and could not ascertain which of them I should take. In my perplexity, I wanted to see someone of whom to ask the way, but could see no one. I determined to go on a few mounds further, and so try to see someone, not a veteran. I gained my object, for after going a couple of hundred yards, I saw before me a single shanty such as I had seen before, with, however, the difference that this was not one for living in, but merely a roof with three walls open in front. From the evidences which the neighborhood exhibited, I took it to be a place for sorting. Within it was an old woman, wrinkled and bent with age. I approached her to ask the way. She rose as I came close, and I asked her my way. She immediately commenced a conversation, and it occurred to me that here in the very center of the kingdom of dust was the place to gather details of the history of Parisian rag-picking, particularly as I could do so from the lips of one who looked like the oldest inhabitant. I began my inquiries, and the old woman gave me most interesting answers. She had been one of the Setuses who sat daily before the guillotine and had taken an active part among the women who signalized themselves by their violence in the revolution. While we were talking, she said suddenly, "'But monsieur must be tired standing,' and dusted a rickety old stool for me to sit down. I hardly liked to do so for many reasons, but the poor old woman was so civil that I did not like to run the risk of hurting her by refusing. And, moreover, the conversation of one who had been at the taking of the Bastille was so interesting that I sat down, and so our conversation went on. While we were talking, an old man, older and more bent and wrinkled even than the woman, appeared from behind the shanty. "'Here is Pierre,' said she. "'Monsieur can hear stories now if he wishes, for Pierre was in everything.' 
from the Bastille to Waterloo. The old man took another stool at my request, and we plunged into a sea of revolutionary reminiscences. This old man, albeit clothed like a scarecrow, was like any one of the six veterans. I was now sitting in the center of the low hut with the woman on my left hand and the man on my right, each of them being somewhat in front of me. The place was full of all sorts of curious objects of lumber, and of many things that I wished far away. In one corner was a heap of rags which seemed to move from the number of vermin it contained, and in the other a heap of bones whose odor was something shocking. Every now and then, glancing at the heaps, I could see the gleaming eyes of some of the rats which infested the place. These loathsome objects were bad enough, but what looked even more dreadful was an old butcher's axe with an iron handle stained with clots of blood leaning up against the wall on the right-hand side. Still, these things did not give me much concern. The talk of the two old people was so fascinating that I stayed on and on, till the evening came and the dust heaps threw dark shadows over the veils between them. After a time I began to grow uneasy. I could not tell how or why, but somehow I did not feel satisfied. Uneasiness is an instinct and means warning. The psychic faculties are often the sentries of the intellect, and when they sound alarm, the reason begins to act, although perhaps not consciously. This was so with me. I began to bethink me where I was and by what surrounded, and to wonder how I should fare in case I should be attacked. And then the thought suddenly burst upon me, although without any overt cause, that I was in danger. Prudence whispered, Be still, and make no sign. And so I was still, and made no sign, for I knew that four cunning eyes were on me. Four eyes, if not more. My God, what a horrible thought! The whole shanty might be surrounded on three sides with villains— I might be in the midst of a band of such desperados as only half a century of periodic revolution can produce. With a sense of danger, my intellect and observation quickened, and I grew more watchful than was my wont. I noticed that the old woman's eyes were constantly wandering toward my hands. I looked at them, too. I saw the cause. My rings. On my left little finger I had a large signet, and on the right a good diamond. I thought that if there was any danger my first care was to avert suspicion. Accordingly, I began to work the conversation round to rag-picking, to the drains, of the things found there, and so, by easy stages, to jewels. Then, seizing a favorable opportunity, I asked the old woman if she knew anything of such things. She answered that she did a little. I held out my right hand, and, showing her the diamond, asked her what she thought of that. She answered that her eyes were bad, and she stooped over my hand. I said as nonchalantly as I could, "'Pardon me, you will see better thus,' and, taking it off, handed it to her. An unholy light came into her withered old face as she touched it. She stole one glance at me, swift and keen as a flash of lightning. She bent over the ring for a moment, her face quite concealed, as though examining it. The old man looked straight out of the front of the shanty before him, at the same time fumbling in his pockets and producing a screw of tobacco in a paper and a pipe, which he proceeded to fill. I took advantage of the pause, and the momentary rest from the searching eyes on my face, to look carefully round the place, now dim and shadowy in the gloaming. There still lay all the heaps of varied reeking foulness. There the terrible blood-stained axe, leaning against the wall in the right-hand corner, and everywhere, despite the gloom, the baleful glitter of the eyes of the rats. I could see them even through some of the chinks of the boards at the back low down close to the ground. But stay, these latter eyes seemed more than usually large and bright and baleful. For an instant my heart stood still, 
and I felt in that whirling condition of mind in which one feels a sort of spiritual drunkenness, and as though the body is only maintained erect in that there is no time for it to fall before recovery. Then, in another second, I was calm, coldly calm, with all my energies in full vigor, with a self-control which I felt to be perfect, and with all my feeling and instincts alert. Now I knew the full extent of my danger. I was watched and surrounded by desperate people. I could not even guess at how many of them were lying there on the ground behind the shanty, waiting for the moment to strike. I knew that I was big and strong, and they knew it too. They knew also, as I did, that I was an Englishman and would make a fight for it. And so we waited. I had, I felt, gained an advantage in the last few seconds, for I knew my danger and understood the situation. Now, I thought, is the test of my courage, the enduring test. The fighting test may come later. The old woman raised her head and said to me in a satisfied kind of way, A very fine ring, indeed, a beautiful ring. Oh, me, I once had such rings, plenty of them, and bracelets, and the rings. Oh, for in those fine days I led the town a dance, but they have forgotten me now, they forgotten me. They? Why, they never heard of me. Perhaps their grandfathers remember me, some of them. And she laughed a harsh, croaking laugh. And then I am bound to say that she astonished me, for she handed me back the ring with a certain suggestion of old-fashioned grace which was not without its pathos. The old man eyed her with a sort of sudden ferocity, half rising from his stool, and said to me suddenly and hoarsely, "'Let me see!' I was about to hand the ring when the old woman said, "'No, no, do not give it to Pierre. Pierre is eccentric. He loses things, and such a pretty ring.' "'Cut!' said the old man savagely. Suddenly the old woman said, rather more loudly than was necessary, "'Wait! I shall tell you something about a ring.' There was something in the sound other voice that jarred upon me. Perhaps it was my hypersensitiveness, wrought up as I was to such a pitch of nervous excitement, but I seemed to think that she was not addressing me. As I stole a glance round the place, I saw the eyes of the rats in the bone heaps, but I missed the eyes along the back. But even as I looked I saw them again appear. The old woman's, wait, had given me a respite from attack, and the men had sunk back to their reclining position. I once lost a ring, a beautiful diamond hoop that had belonged to a queen, and which was given to me by a farmer of the taxes, who afterwards cut his throat because I sent him away. I thought it must have been stolen and taxed my people, but I could get no trace. The police came and suggested that it had found its way to the drain. We descended, I in my fine clothes, for I would not trust them with my beautiful ring. I know more of the drain since then, and of the rats too but I shall never forget the horror of that place, alive with brazing eyes, a wall of them just outside the light of our torches. Well, we got beneath my house. We searched the outlet of the drain, and there, in the filth, found my ring, and we came out. But we found something else else before we came. As we were coming toward the opening, a lot of sewer rats, human ones this time, came toward us. They told the police that one of their number had gone into the drain, but had not returned. He had gone in only shortly before we had, and, if lost, could hardly be far off. They asked help to seek him, so we turned back. They tried to prevent me going, 
but I insisted. It was a new excitement, and I had not recovered my ring. Not far did we go till we came on something. There was but little water, and the bottom of the drain was raised with brick, rubbish, and much matter of the kind. He had made a fight for it, even when his torch had gone out, but they were too many for him. They had not been long about it. The bones were still warm, but they were picked clean. They had not been long about it. The bones were still warm, but they were picked clean. They had even eaten their own dead ones, and there were bones of rats as well as of the men. They took it cool enough, those are there, the human ones, and joked of their comrade when they found him dead, though they would have helped him living. Bah! What matter is it, life or death? And had you no fear? I asked her. Fear? she said with a laugh. Me have fear? Ask Pierre. But I was young ere then and as I came through that horrible drain with its wall of greedy eyes, always moving with the circle of the light from the torches, I did not feel easy. I kept on before the men, though. It was a way I have. I never let the men get it before me. All I want is a chance and a means. And they ate him up, took every trace away except the bones, and no one knew it, no, no sound of him was ever heard. Here she broke into a chuckling fit of the ghastliest merriment which it was ever my lot to hear and see. A great poetess describes her heroine singing, Oh, to see or hear her singing, scarce I know which is the divinest. And I can apply the same idea to the old crone, in all save the divinity, for I scarce could tell which was the most hellish, the harsh, malicious, satisfied, cruel laugh, or the leering grin, and the horrible square opening of the mouth like a tragic mask, and the yellow gleam of the few discolored teeth in the shapeless gums. In that laugh, and with that grin and the chuckling satisfaction, I knew as well as if it had been spoken to me in words of thunder that my murder was settled and the murderers only bided the proper time for its accomplishment. I could read between the lines of her gruesome story the commands to her accomplices. Wait, she seemed to say, bide your time. I shall strike the first blow. Find the weapon for me, and I shall make the opportunity. He shall not escape. Keep him quiet, and then no one will be wiser. There will be no outcry and the rats will do their work. It was growing darker and darker. The night was coming. I stole a glance round the shanty, still all the same. The bloody axe in the corner, the heaps of filth, and the eyes on the bone heaps and in the crannies of the floor. Pierre had been still ostensibly filling his pipe. He now struck a light and began to puff away at it. The old woman said, Dear heart, how dark it is! Pierre, like a good lad, light the lamp. Pierre got up, and with the lighted match in his hand, touched the wick of a lamp which hung at one side of the entrance to the shanty, and which had a reflector that threw the light all over the place. It was evidently that which was used for their sorting at night. Not that, stupid! Not that! The lantern! she called out to him. He immediately blew it out, saying, "'All right, mother, I'll find it.' And he hustled about the left corner of the room, the old woman saying through the darkness, "'The lantern! The lantern! Oh, that is the light that is most useful to us poor folks. The lantern was the friend of the revolution. It is the friend of the chiffonier. It helps us when all else fails.' Hardly had she said the word when there was a kind of creaking of the whole place, and something was steadily dragged over the roof. Again I seemed to read between the lines of her words. I knew the lesson of the lantern. 
one of you get on the roof with a noose and strangle him as he passes out if we fail within. As I looked out of the opening, I saw the loop of a rope outlined black against the lurid sky. I was now indeed beset. Pierre was not long in finding the lantern. I kept my eyes fixed through the darkness on the old woman. Pierre struck his light, and by its flash I saw the old woman raise from the ground beside her, where it had mysteriously appeared, and then hide in the folds other gown, a long sharp knife or dagger. It seemed to be like a butcher's sharpening iron, fine to a keen point. The lantern was lit. "'Bring it here, Pierre,' she said. "'Place it in the doorway, where we can see it. See how nice it is. It shuts out the darkness from us. It is just right.' just right for her and her purposes, it threw all its light on my face, leaving in gloom the faces of both Pierre and the woman, who sat outside of me on each side. I felt that the time of action was approaching, and I knew now that the first signal and movement would come from the woman, so I watched her. I was all unarmed, but I had made up my mind what to do. At the first movement, I would seize the butcher's axe in the right-hand corner and fight my way out. At least, I would die hard. I stole a glance round to fix its exact locality so that I could not fail to seize it at the first effort, for then, if ever, time and accuracy would be precious. Good God! It was gone! All the horror of the situation burst upon me. But the bitterest thought of all was that if the issue of the terrible position should be against me, Alice would infallibly suffer. Either she would believe me false, and any lover, or any one who has ever been one, can imagine the bitterness of the thought, or else she would go on loving long after I had been lost to her and to the world, so that her life would be broken and embittered, shattered with disappointment and despair. The very magnitude of the pain braced me up and nerved me to bear the dread scrutiny of the plotters. I think I did not betray myself. The old woman was watching me as a cat does a mouse. She had her right hand hidden in the folds of her gown, clutching, I knew, that long, cruel-looking dagger. Had she seen any disappointment in my face, she would, I felt, have known that the moment had come and would have sprung on me like a tigress, certain of taking me unprepared. I looked out into the night, and there I saw new cause for danger. Before and around the hut were, at a little distance, some shadowy forms. They were quite still, but I knew that they were all alert and on guard. Small chance for me now in that direction." Again I stole a glance round the place. In moments of great excitement and of great danger, which is excitement, the mind works very quickly, and the keenness of the faculties which depend on the mind grows in proportion. I now felt this. In an instant I took in the whole situation. I saw that the axe had been taken through a small hole made in one of the rotten boards. How rotten they must be to allow of such a thing being done without a particle of noise. The hut was a regular murder trap, and was guarded all around. A garroter lay on the roof ready to entangle me with his noose if I should escape the dagger of the old hag. In front the way was guarded by I know not how many watchers, and at the back was a row of desperate men. I had seen their eyes still through the crack in the boards of the floor when last I looked, as they lay prone waiting for the signal to start erect. If it was to be ever, now for it. As nonchalantly as I could, I turned slightly on my stool so as to get my right leg well under me. Then, with a sudden jump, turning my head and guarding it with my hands, and with the fighting instinct of the knights of old, I breathed my lady's name and hurled myself against the back wall of the hut. 
Watching as they were, the suddenness of my movement surprised both Pierre and the old woman. As I crashed through the rotten timbers, I saw the old woman rise with a leap like a tiger and heard her low gasp of baffled rage. My feet lit on something that moved, and as I jumped away, I knew that I had stepped on the back of one of the row of men lying on their faces outside the hut. I was torn with nails and splinters, but otherwise unhurt. Breathless, I rushed up the mound in front of me, hearing as I went the dull crash of the shanty as it collapsed into a mass. It was a nightmare climb. The mound, though but low, was awfully steep, and with each step I took the mass of dust and cinders tore down with me and gave way under my feet. The dust rose and choked me. It was sickening, fetid, awful. But my climb was, I felt, for life or death, and I struggled on. The seconds seemed hours, but the few moments I had in starting, combined with my youth and strength, gave me a great advantage, and though several forms struggled after me in deadly silence, which was more dreadful than any sound, I easily reached the top. Since then I have climbed the cone of Vesuvius, and as I struggled up that dreary steep amid the sulphurous fumes and memory of that awful night at Montrouge, came back to me so vividly that I almost grew faint. The mound was one of the tallest in the region of dust, and as I struggled to the top, panting for breath and with my heart beating like a sledgehammer, I saw away to my left the dull red gleam of the sky and nearer still the flash of lights. Thank God! I knew where I was now, and where lay the road to Paris. For two or three seconds I paused and looked back. My pursuers were still well behind me, but struggling up resolutely and in deadly silence. Beyond, the shanty was a wreck, a mass of timber and moving forms. I could see it well for flames were already bursting out. The rags and straw had evidently caught fire from the lantern. Still silence there, not a sound. These old wretches could die game anyhow. I had no time for more than a passing glance, for as I cast an eye round the mound preparatory to making my descent, I saw several dark forms rushing round on either side to cut me off on my way. It was now a race for life. They were trying to head me on my way to Paris, and with the instinct of the moment I dashed down to the right-hand side. I was just in time, for, though I came as it seemed to me down the steep in a few steps, the wary old men who were watching me turned back, and one, as I rushed by into the opening between the two mounds in front, almost struck me a blow with that terrible butcher's axe. There could surely not be two such weapons about. Then began a really horrible chase. I easily ran ahead of the old men, and even when some younger ones and a few women joined in the hunt, I easily distanced them. But I did not know the way, and I could not even guide myself by the light in the sky, for I was running away from it. I had heard that, unless of conscious purpose, hunted men turn always to the left, and so I found it now, and so, I suppose, knew also my pursuers, who were more animals than men, and with cunning or instinct had found out such secrets for themselves. For on finishing a quick spurt, after which I intended to take a moment's breathing space, I suddenly saw ahead of me two or three forms swiftly passing behind a mound to the right. I was in the spider's web now, indeed. But with the thought of this new danger came the resource of the hunted, and so I darted down the next turning to the right. I continued in this direction for some hundred yards, and then, making a turn to the left again, felt certain that I had, at any rate, avoided the danger of being surrounded. But not of pursuit. For on came the rabble after me, steady, dogged, relentless, and still in grim silence. In the greater darkness the mound seemed now to be somewhat smaller than before, although, for the night was closing, they looked bigger in proportion. I was now well ahead of my pursuers, so I made a dart up the mound in front. 
Oh, joy of joys! I was close to the edge of this inferno of dust heaps. Away behind me, the red light of Paris in the sky, and towering up behind rose the heights of Montmartre, a dim light, with here and there brilliant points like stars. Restored to vigor in a moment, I ran over the few remaining mounds of decreasing size, and found myself on the level land beyond. Even then, however, the prospect was not inviting. All before me was dark and dismal, and I had evidently come on one of those dank, low-lying waste places which are found here and there in the neighborhood of great cities. Places of waste and desolation, where the space is required for the ultimate agglomeration of all that is noxious, and the ground is so poor as to create no desire of occupancy even in the lowest squatter. With eyes accustomed to the gloom of the evening, and away now from the shadows of those dreadful dust heaps, I could see much more easily than I could a little while ago. It might have been, of course, that the glare in the sky of the lights of Paris, though the city was some miles away, was reflected here. Howsoever it was, I saw well enough to take bearings for certainly some little distance around me. In front was a bleak, flat waste that seemed almost dead level, with here and there the dark shimmering of stagnant pools. Seemingly far off on the right, amid a small cluster of scattered lights, rose a dark mass of Fort Montrouge, and away to the left, in the dim distance, pointed with stray gleams from cottage windows, the lights in the sky show the locality of Bicetre. A moment's thought decided me to take to the right and to try to reach Montrouge. There at least would be some sort of safety, and I might possibly long before come on some of the crossroads which I knew. Somewhere, not far off, must lie the strategic road made to connect the outlying chain of forts circling the city. Then I looked back. Coming over the mounds, and outlined black against the glare of the Parisian horizon, I saw several moving figures, and still away to the right several more deploying out between me and my destination. They evidently meant to cut me off in this direction, and so my choice became constricted. It lay now between going straight ahead or turning to the left. Stooping to the ground, so as to get the advantage of the horizon as a line of sight, I looked carefully in this direction, but could detect no sign of my enemies. I argued that, as they had not guarded, or were not trying to guard that point, there was evidently danger to me there already. So I made up my mind to go straight on before me. It was not an inviting prospect, and as I went on the reality grew worse. The ground became soft and oozy, and now and again gave way beneath me in a sickening kind of way. I seemed somehow to be going down, for I saw round me places seemingly more elevated than where I was, and this in a place which from a little way back seemed dead level. I looked around, but could see none of my pursuers. This was strange, for all along these birds of the night had followed me through the darkness as well as though it was broad daylight. How I blamed myself for coming out in my light-colored tourist suit of tweed. The silence, and my not being able to see my enemies, whilst I felt that they were watching me, grew appalling, and in the hope of someone not of this ghastly crew hearing me, I raised my voice and shouted several times. There was not the slightest response. Not even an echo rewarded my efforts. For a while I stood stock still and kept my eyes in one direction. On one of the rising places around me I saw something dark move along, then another, and another. This was to my left, and seemingly moving to head me off. I thought that again I might, with my skill as a runner, elude my enemies at this game, and so, with all my speed, darted forward. Splash! My feet had given way in a mass of slimy rubbish, and I had fallen headlong into a reeking, stagnant pool. 
The water and the mud in which my arms sank up to the elbows was filthy and nauseous beyond description, and in the suddenness of my fall I had actually swallowed some of the filthy stuff, which nearly choked me and made me gasp for breath. Never shall I forget the moments during which I stood trying to recover myself, almost fainting from the fetid odor of the filthy pool, whose white mist rose ghost-like around. Worst of all, with the acute despair of the hunted animal, when he sees the pursuing pack closing on him, I saw before my eyes, whilst I stood helpless, the dark forms of my pursuers moving swiftly to surround me. It is curious how our minds work on odd matters, even when the energies of thought are seemingly concentrated on some terrible and pressing need. I was in momentary peril of my life. My safety depended on my action, and my choice of alternatives coming now with almost every step I took. And yet I could not but think of the strange, dogged persistency of these old men. Their silent resolution, their steadfast, grim persistency, even in such a cause, commanded, as well as fear, even a measure of respect. What must they have been in the vigor of their youth? I could understand now that whirlwind rush on the bridge of Arcola, that scornful exclamation of the old guard at Waterloo. Unconscious celebration has its own pleasures, even at such moments. But, fortunately, it does not in any way clash with the thought from which action springs. I realized at a glance that so far I was defeated in my object. My enemies as yet had won. They had succeeded in surrounding me on three sides, and were bent on driving me off to the left hand, where there was already some danger for me, for they had left no guard. I accepted the alternative. It was a case of Hobson's choice and run. I had to keep to the lower ground, for my pursuers were on the higher places. However, though the ooze and broken ground impeded me, my youth and training made me able to hold my ground, and by keeping a diagonal line I not only kept them from gaining on me, but even began to distance them. This gave me new heart and strength and by this time habitual training was beginning to tell, and my second wind had come. Before me the ground rose slightly. I rushed up the slope and found before me a waste of watery slime, with a low dike or bank looking black and grim beyond. I felt that if I could but reach that dike in safety, I could there, with solid ground under my feet and some kind of path to guide me, find with comparative ease a way out of my troubles. After a glance right and left, and seeing no one near, I kept my eyes for a few minutes to their rightful work of aiding my feet, whilst I crossed the swamp. It was rough, hard work, but there was little danger, merely toil, and a short time took me to the dike. I rushed up the slope exulting, but here again I met a new shock. On either side of me rose a number of crouching figures. From right and left they rushed at me. Each body held a rope. The cordon was nearly complete. I could pass on neither side, and the end was near. There was only one chance, and I took it. I hurled myself across the dike, and escaping out of the very clutches of my foes, threw myself into the stream. At any other time I should have thought that water foul and filthy, but now it was as welcome as the most crystal stream to the parched traveler. It was a highway of safety. My pursuers rushed after me. Had only one of them held the rope, it would have been all up with me, for he could have entangled me before I had time to swim a stroke. But the many hands holding it embarrassed and delayed them and when the rope struck the water I heard the splash well behind me. A few minutes' hard swimming took me across the stream. Refreshed with the immersion and encouraged by the escape, 
I climbed the dike in comparative gaiety of spirits. From the top I looked back. Through the darkness I saw my assailants scattering up and down along the dike. The pursuit was evidently not ended, and again I had to choose my course. Beyond the dike where I stood was a wild, swampy space very similar to that which I had crossed. I determined to shun such a place, and thought for a moment whether I would take up or down the dike. I thought I heard the sound, the muffled sound of oars, so I listened, and then shouted. No response, but the sound ceased. My enemies had evidently got a boat of some kind. As they were on the upside of me, I took the down path and began to run. As I passed to the left of where I had entered the water, I heard several splashes, soft and stealthy, like the sound a rat makes as he plunges into the stream, but vastly greater. And as I looked, I saw the dark sheen of the water broken by the ripples of several advancing heads. Some of my enemies were swimming the stream also and now behind me, up the stream, the silence was broken by the quick rattle and creak of oars. My enemies were in hot pursuit. I put my best leg foremost and ran on. After a break of a couple of minutes, I looked back, and by a gleam of light through the ragged clouds, I saw several dark forms climbing the bank behind me. The wind had now begun to rise, and the water beside me was ruffled and beginning to break in tiny waves on the bank. I had to keep my eyes pretty well on the ground before me, lest I should stumble, for I knew that to stumble was death. After a few minutes, I looked back behind me. On the dike were only a few dark figures, but crossing the waste, swampy ground were many more. What new danger this portended, I did not know, could only guess. Then, as I ran, it seemed to me that my track kept ever sloping away to the right. I looked up ahead and saw that the river was much wider than before, and that the dike on which I stood fell quite away, and beyond it was another stream on whose near bank I saw some of the dark forms now across the marsh. I was on an island of some kind. My situation was now indeed terrible, for my enemies had hemmed me in on every side. Behind came the quickening roll of the oars, as though my pursuers knew that the end was close. Around me on every side was desolation. There was not a roof or light as far as I could see. Far off to the right rose some dark mass, but what it was I knew not. For a moment I paused to think what I should do, not for more, for my pursuers were drawing closer. Then my mind was made up. I slipped down the bank and took to the water. I struck out straight ahead, so as to gain the current by clearing the backwater of the island, for such I presume it was, when I had passed into the stream. I waited till a cloud came driving across the moon and leaving all in darkness. Then I took off my hat and laid it softly on the water, floating with the stream, and a second after dived to the right and struck out under water with all my might. I was, I suppose, half a minute under water, and when I rose came up as softly as I could, and turning looked back. There went my light brown hat floating merrily away. Close behind it came a rickety old boat, driven furiously by a pair of oars. The moon was still partly obscured by the drifting clouds, but in the partial light I could see a man in the bows holding aloft ready to strike what appeared to me to be that same dreadful pole-axe which I had before escaped. As I looked, the boat drew closer, closer, and the man struck savagely. The hat disappeared. The man fell forward, almost out of the boat. His comrades dragged him in, but without the axe, and then as I turned with all my energies bent on reaching the further bank, I heard the fierce whirr of the muttered, Sacre, which marked the anger of my baffled pursuers. 
That was the first sound I had heard from human lips during all this dreadful chase, and, full as it was of menace and danger to me, it was a welcome sound, for it broke that awful silence which shrouded and appalled me. It was as though an overt sign that my opponents were men and not ghosts, and that with them I had, at least, the chance of a man, though but one against many. But now that the spell of silence was broken, the sounds came thick and fast. From boat to shore, and back from shore to boat, came quick question and answer, all in the fiercest whispers. I looked back, a fatal thing to do, for in the instant someone caught sight of my face, which showed white on the dark water, and shouted. Hands pointed to me, and in a moment or two the boat was under way, and following hard after me. I had but a little way to go, but quicker and quicker came the boat after me. A few more strokes, and I would be on shore, but I felt the oncoming of the boat, and expected each second to feel the crash of an oar or other weapon on my head. Had I not seen that dreadful axe disappear in the water, I do not think that I could have won the shore. I heard the muttered curses of those not rowing, and the labored breath of the rowers. With one supreme effort for life or liberty, I touched the bank and sprang up it. There was not a single second to spare, for hard behind me the boat grounded and several dark forms sprang after me. I gained the top of the dike and, keeping to the left, ran on again. The boat put off and followed down the stream. Seeing this, I feared danger in this direction, and quickly turning, ran down the dike on the other side and after passing a short stretch of marshy ground gained a wild, open, flat country and sped on. Still behind me came on my relentless pursuers. Far away, below me, I saw the same dark mass as before, but now grown closer and greater. My heart gave a great thrill of delight, for I knew that it must be the fortress of Bicetra, and with new courage I ran on. I had heard that between each and all of the protecting forts of Paris there are strategic ways, deep sunk roads, where soldiers marching should be sheltered from an enemy. I knew that if I could gain this road I would be safe, but in the darkness I could not see any sign of it, so in blind hope of striking it I ran on. Presently I came to the edge of a deep cut and found that down below me ran a road guarded on each side by a ditch of water, fenced on either side by a straight high wall. Getting fainter and dizzier, I ran on. The ground got more broken, more and more still, till I staggered and fell and rose again, and ran on in the blind anguish of the hunted. Again the thought of Alice nerved me. I would not be lost and wreck her life, I would fight and struggle for life to the bitter end. With a great effort I caught the top of the wall. As, scrambling like a catamount, I drew myself up, I actually felt a hand touch the sole of my foot. I was now on a sort of causeway, and before me I saw a dim light. Blind and dizzy I ran on, staggered and fell, rising, covered with dust and blood. Halt, la! The words sounded like a voice from heaven. A blaze of light seemed to enwrap me, and I shouted with joy. Que la va! The rattle of musketry, the flash of steel before my eyes. Instinctively, I stopped, though close behind me came a rush of my pursuers. Another word or two, and out from a gateway poured, as it seemed to me, a tide of red and blue, as the guard turned out. All around seemed blazing with light, and the flash of steel, the clink and rattle of arms, and the loud, harsh voices of command. As I fell forward, utterly exhausted, a soldier caught me. I looked back in dreadful expectation and saw the mass of dark forms disappearing into the night. Then I must have fainted. When I recovered my senses, I was in the guard room. They gave me a brandy, and after a while I was able to tell them something of what had passed. 
Then a commissary of police appeared, apparently out of the empty air, as is the way of the Parisian police officer. He listened attentively, and then had a moment's consultation with the officer in command. Apparently they were agreed, for they asked me if I were ready now to come with them. "'Where to?' I asked, rising to go. "'Back to the dust heaps. We shall, perhaps, catch them yet.' "'I shall try,' said I. He eyed me for a moment keenly, and said suddenly, "'Would you like to wait a while, or till tomorrow, young Englishman?' This touched me to the quick, as perhaps he intended, and I jumped to my feet. "'Come now,' I said. "'Now! Now! An Englishman is always ready for his duty!' The commissary was a good fellow, as well as a shrewd one. He slapped my shoulder kindly. "'Brave garçon,' he said. "'Forgive me, but I knew what you would do most good. The guard is ready. Come!' And so, passing right through the guard-room and through a long vaulted passage, we were out into the night. A few of the men in front had powerful lanterns. Through courtyards and down a sloping way we passed out through a low archway to a sunken road, the same that I had seen in my flight. The order was given to get at the double, and with a quick springing stride, half run, half walk, the soldiers went swiftly along. I felt my strength renewed again. Such is the difference between hunter and hunted. A very short distance took us to a low-lying pontoon bridge across the stream, and evidently very little higher up than I had struck it. Some effort had evidently been made to damage it, for the ropes had all been cut, and one of the chains had been broken. I heard the officer say to the commissary, "'We are just in time.' A few more minutes, and they would have destroyed the bridge. Forward, quicker still! And on we went. Again we reached a pontoon on the winding stream. As we came up, we heard the hollow boom of the metal drums as the efforts to destroy the bridge was again renewed. A word of command was given, and several men raised their rifles. Fire! A volley rang out. There was a muffled cry, and the dark forms disappeared. But the evil was done, and we saw the far end of the pontoon swing into the stream. This was a serious delay, and it was nearly an hour before we had renewed ropes and restored the bridge sufficiently to allow us to cross. We renewed the chase. Quicker, quicker we went toward the dust heaps. After a time we came to a place that I knew. There were the remains of a fire— a few smoldering wood ashes still cast a red glow, but the bulk of the ashes were cold. I knew the sight of the hut and the hill behind it up which I had rushed, and in the flickering glow the eyes of the rats still shone with a sort of phosphorescence. The commissary spoke a word to the officer, and he cried, Halt! The soldiers were ordered to spread around and watch, and then we commenced to examine the ruins. The commissary himself began to lift away the charred boards and rubbish. These the soldiers took and piled together. Presently he started back, then bent down, and rising beckoned me. See, he said. It was a gruesome sight. There lay a skeleton face downwards, a woman by the lines, an old woman by the coarse fiber of the bone. Between the ribs rose a long, spike-like dagger made from a butcher's sharpening knife, its keen point buried in the spine. "'You will observe,' said the commissary to the officer, and to me as he took out his notebook, "'that the woman must have fallen on her dagger. The rats are many here. See, their eyes glistening among that heap of bones. And you will also notice—' I shuddered as he placed his hand on the skeleton, that but little time was lost by them, for the bones are scarcely cold. There was no other sign of any one near, living or dead, and so, deploying again into line, the soldiers passed on. Presently we came to the hut made of the old wardrobe. We approached. 
In five of the six compartments was an old man sleeping, sleeping so soundly that even the glare of the lanterns did not wake them. Old and grim and grizzled they looked, with their gaunt, wrinkled, bronzed faces and their white mustaches. The officer called out harshly and loudly a word of command, and in an instant each one of them was on his feet before us and standing at attention. "'What do you hear?' "'We sleep,' was the answer. "'Where are the other chiffoniers?' asked the commissary. "'Gone to work.' "'And you?' "'We are on guard.' "'Peste!' laughed the officer grimly, as he looked at the old men one after the other in the face and added with cool, deliberate cruelty, "'Asleep on duty. Is this the manner of the old guard?' No wonder, then, a Waterloo. By the gleam of the lantern I saw the grim old faces grow deadly pale, and almost shuddered at the look in the eyes of the old men as the laugh of the soldiers echoed the grim pleasantry of the officer. I felt in that moment that I was in some measure avenged. For a moment they looked as if they would throw themselves on the taunter, but years of their life had schooled them, and they remained still. "'You are but five, said the commissary. "'Where is the sixth? The answer came with a grim chuckle. "'E is there,' and the speaker pointed to the bottom of the wardrobe. "'E died last night. You won't find much of him. The burial of the rats is quick.' The commissary stooped and looked in. Then he turned to the officer and said calmly, "'We may as well go back. No trace here now. Nothing to prove that man was the one wounded by your soldier's bullets. Probably they murdered him to cover up the trace. See?' Again he stooped and placed his hands on the skeleton. "'The rats wear quickly, and they are many. These bones are warm.' I shuddered and so did many more of those around me. "'Farm!' said the officer, and so in marching order, with the lanterns swinging in front and the manacled veterans in the midst, with steady tramp we took ourselves out of the dust heaps and turned backward to the fortress of Bicetra. My year of probation has long since ended, and Alice is my wife. But when I look back upon that trying twelve-month, one of the most vivid incidents that memory recalls is that associated with my visit to the city of dust. The End of The Burial of the Rats by Bram Stoker <laughs>